This is the Super NES Classic Edition, the brand new all-in-one retro console that plays 21 of the most popular 16-bit games of all time. It's coming September 29th for $79.99 and includes games like F-Zero, Super Metroid, Final Fantasy III, Kirby Superstar, Contra 3, Donkey Kong Country, and even Super Punch-Out. It's an impressive list that made me wonder, what's the best reviewed game on the Super NES Classic? To find the answer, I decided to turn to my Classic Magazine Review Archive, a comprehensive list of old-school game reviews found in dozens of magazines from the United States, UK, and all around the world. I'm talking about old issues of Electronic Gaming Monthly, Super Play, Nintendo Power, Next Generation, Game Players, Game Pro, and many more. I've decided to average the old-school reviews and score each game packaged in the Super NES Classic. And today we're going to count down the entire list from worst to best. What's the best reviewed game? Let's find out. Of the 21 games packaged with the Super NES Classic Edition, Star Fox 2 is the only one without any reviews. Obviously. I mean, it never came out. So about the best we can do are previews. But let's be honest, this is the real draw here. It's taken Nintendo more than two decades to officially release Star Fox 2, and that alone is a pretty good reason to pick up this plug-and-play device. But with no reviews, there's no reason to talk about it. So, let's go ahead and see how the other 20 games rank. Although it's a cherished cult classic these days, critics weren't exactly sold on Earthbound 22 years ago. They hated the cutesy graphics and wrote it off as nothing more than a misguided kids game. Game players summed it up this way. It ain't bad, but it ain't real exciting either. GamePro worried that the humor is too mature for little kids, and the gameplay is too immature for older gamers. We also saw video games and computer entertainment chime in and conclude that all Earthbound has to offer is a Barney-esque romp in a McDonald's playground. Eesh. To be fair, there were a few critics that were completely won over by Nintendo's misunderstood role-playing game. Diehard game fans Kay Lee notes that at first glance, Earthbound seems like an RPG for children with its dinky play school-like graphics and youthful main hero. In reality, this has one of the most coherent, sophisticated, and funny storylines of any RPG. Superplay and Nintendo Power were also fond of the game. When all is said and done, Earthbound averages a disappointing 74%. Neither a mascot platformer nor a traditional golf game, Kirby's Dream Course floats somewhere in the middle and makes the most out of an admittedly crazy concept. Thankfully, the critics were ready to go with Nintendo on this one and accept Kirby as the next big golf superstar. All right. Kirby's Dream Course is too cute for its own good, starts the next generation. But this game is surprisingly unique and fascinating. If you can keep from choking on the saccharin, this game is so unique that it rates it four stars just because it's unlike anything we've seen. Video games and computer entertainment also liked the game, calling it entertaining and a worthy game for one or two players, but only gave it an eight. GamePro gave it a 4.5 out of 5 and warned that if you're not a Kirby fan, you'll definitely miss the hole with this game. The lowest score came from Nintendo Power, which only gave it a 3.7 out of 5. Everybody liked Kirby's Dream Course, but none of the critics loved it. This weirdo golf game putted an 81%. While everybody's attention is currently on ARMS, it was another fast-paced boxing game that was stealing the spotlight 23 years ago. Super Punch-Out wasn't just another dull sports game, but rather the boxing equivalent of an arcade fighting game. In fact, that's exactly what Super Play said before giving it a 90%. They also argued that video game boxing was never this good. Although both game players and game pro were quick to throw high scores at Super Punch-Out, not every magazine was won over by this long overdue sequel. Nintendo Power gave it a 3.6 out of 5 and noted the difficulty. 
Next Generation complained about the slow and choppy animation, and video games and computer entertainment wasn't all that into the characters. Stating the obvious, Electronic Gaming Monthly concluded that Super Punch-Out may not be a realistic boxing game, but it still has fantastic gameplay. When averaged together, Super Punch-Out knocked out a score of 85%. What I love about the 16-bit era is how it allowed developers to show us the full potential of some of their greatest 8-bit games. This was definitely the case with Contra 3, The Alien Wars. While the first two installments on the NES were good shoot-'em-ups, Konami was able to take this series to the next level with Part 3. In fact, I'd argue that this is peak Contra. The critics agreed. Electronic Gaming Monthly raved that it's the best thrill for the money to come along for any system in a long time. It's hard to argue with that. The European press seemed especially impressed with this run-and-gun shooter. Contra 3 picked up a 90% from Superplay, 91% from computer and video games, 92% from N-Force, and a staggering 95% from Nintendo Magazine System, making it one of their highest-rated games of all time. American critics weren't nearly as blown away, with GamePro giving it a 4 out of 5 and Nintendo Power going with a 3.9 out of 5. Video games and computer entertainment went even lower. They gave Contra 3 a 7 and compared it to gourmet coffee. It smells great and ought to satisfy the addicted. Instead of pondering that deep thought, I think I'm just going to jump to the end and say the Konami 16-bit shooter averaged a score of 86%. For many, Super Castlevania IV was the last game they played in the series before Symphony of the Night came along and changed everything. Critics loved the 16-bit graphics and music, but were getting a little bored of the formula. Enforce called the game slow-paced, while Super NES Buyer's Guide missed changing characters like in Castlevania III. Video games and computer entertainment loved the game, giving it a 9 out of 10 but noted that it has problems with slowdowns when the action heats up. Speaking of high scores, Frank O'Connor at Computer and Video Games gave Super Castlevania IV a 93%, but even with that stellar mark, Frank cautioned that the first few levels are kind of a slog. But apparently all it takes is a little patience on the completely boring early levels and you're met with rewards aplenty as the game turns into the hot love action extravagance of zombie whipping larks. GamePro didn't need a caveat because they were confident about giving it a perfect 5 out of 5 and concluding that the cart should be at the top of every SNES owner's holiday wish list. It's hard to argue with that. Super Castlevania 4 whips up an impressive 86%. Simon Belmont isn't the only video game action hero killing ghosts and goblins on the Super NES Classic Edition, because Sir Arthur is back in Super Ghouls and Ghosts. This is the sequel to the best-reviewed game of 1989, so all eyes were on Capcom to deliver an even bigger and better follow-up. While Electronic Gaming Monthly was quick to call it the best version of Ghouls and Ghosts to date, most critics weren't as convinced. Superplay liked the game, but called out the unfair difficulty and awkward game structure. Super Gaming complained that it wasn't as iconic as the original and gave it an 8. That seemed to be the consensus with most critics. Computer and Video Games gave it an 89%, GamePro gave it a 4 out of 5, and Nintendo Power moaned about the occasional slowdowns. Even with Nintendo Magazine System and Mean Machines giving it near-perfect scores, Super Ghouls and Ghosts is only able to average an 86%. Kirby Superstar was a good game released in a bad year. Had this adorable 2D platformer been released, say, three years earlier, chances are it would have ridden a wave of great press and strong review scores. But this was a 16-bit game released at a time when everybody else was moving on to 32 and 64-bit consoles. As a result, very few magazines even bothered to review Kirby Superstar when it hit the Super NES in 1996. Superplay called it pretty much everything you'd expect from Kirby on the SNES to be, and gave it an 89%. This isn't far off from Electronic Gaming Monthly, which had scores ranging from 8 up to a 9. 
I don't understand why I like this game, notes a confused Dan. It's great to see games like this still coming out, explains Sean. Even Sushi X liked it, though his recommendation came with a warning. For diehard Super NES owners out there only purchasing one game this year, Kirby should be it. Were there really people like that in 1996? I don't know. But what I can tell you is that Kirby's Superstar averages an 87%. It may not be as epic, ambitious, and well-written as Final Fantasy III and Chrono Trigger, but Secret of Mana has something that few other Square Adventure games have. Room for three people. Forget about Street Fighter II and Mario Kart, because this is the best multiplayer game on the Super NES Classic Edition. Superplay called it a veritable tour de force and gave it a 94%. SNES Forest went even higher, naming it the best RPG ever. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but Secret of Mana is definitely great. Of course, not everybody felt the same way. Video Games Magazine complained about the painfully boring dialogue and didn't feel it lived up to its potential. He also saw Game Informer hesitant to give Secret of Mana the high scores it usually reserved for the most epic RPGs. Die Hard Game Fan, on the other hand, didn't seem to mind. They loved the multiplayer mode and trademark square quality graphics and music. With strong scores from all around the world, Secret of Mana managed to average a score of 88%. The idea of Nintendo and Square coming together to create a Super Mario role-playing game sounded crazy back in the mid-1990s, but it turned out to be a natural fit. I can honestly say that I did not expect to see a brand new Mario game until the Nintendo 64 was unveiled, starts Electronic Gaming Monthly. The characters seemed too childish for older gamers, but the long adventure itself, that involves actual gameplay and a good storyline, will keep many gamers interested. Some critics felt like it was a step back when compared to games like Final Fantasy III and Chrono Trigger. Superplay called Super Mario RPG a short, cute, and extremely simplistic introduction to role-playing by Nintendo's most famous characters. Video games and computer entertainment called the game annoying and only recommended it for hardcore Mario fans. Diehard game fan disagreed, with all three critics giving the game near-perfect scores. I'm confused. How did Square squeeze all of this joy into a tiny little cart? I'm beginning to wonder if 16-bit will ever die. With strong scores from game pro, game players, and even next generation, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars averages an 88%. There were two showpiece games at the Super NES launch, Pilot Wings and F-Zero. I'm glad Nintendo decided to include the fully realized racing game, and not the glorified tech demo. F-Zero rocks, and it's not just because of the Mode 7 effects. This is a fast-paced racer with expertly crafted stages, cool characters, and a killer soundtrack. Of course, critics were mostly excited to talk about the scaling and rotation effects. Nintendo Magazine System called F-Zero an essential purchase. Game players called it the system's best racing game. GamePro said that F-Zero shows what the SNES can really do. This is not just another racing game, starts Sushi X at Electronic Gaming Monthly. The hairpin turns and flying jumps are enough to make my head spin. The only real complaint the critics had was that F-Zero lacked any kind of two-player mode. That's a mistake Nintendo corrected with their follow-up racer, but we'll get to that soon enough. F-Zero averaged a speedy 89%. Good news, everybody! The platformer genre isn't as awful as you think it is. At least, that's the revelation we get from Superplay's review of Mega Man X. No, oh, seriously. The lesson I've learned from playing Mega Man X is that platform games aren't bad by definition, explains Z. Nicholson. There's still some life left in the genre, if it's used in clever and innovative ways. Phew. And then again, this is the same guy who thought the sequel would be called Mega Man XI. Thankfully, no other magazines seemed confused by this Mega Man spin-off. Many critics loved the game, 
noting that it was one of the best 16-bit platformers on the market. Game players called it easily the best of the 10 Mega Man titles so far, which makes me want to check his math. GamePro also loved the game, but offered this awful advice for people who like staying employed. Take Mega Man X and call in sick tomorrow. However, not all critics felt like it was a step in the right direction for Mega Man. All four diehard game fan editors hammered Mega Man X for not being very original. But even with all that criticism, Mega Man X still managed to average a rock-solid 90%. If you came here expecting the critics to crap all over Super Mario World, then prepare to be disappointed. It shouldn't surprise anybody that critics fell in love with Super Mario World when it launched on the Super NES in 1991. Boasting cool graphics, super sound, and amazing gameplay, Super Mario Bros. 4 is probably the best video game in the world, raves Nintendo Magazine system. I thought there was no way that Mario 3 on the NES could be top for sheer playability, but then along comes Mario 4 and blows them all away, concludes computer and video games. I'm telling you, it's impossible to find a bad review of Super Mario World. Just about the closest we come to a negative review is from Electronic Gaming Monthly, and it's more of a mild disappointment than anything. Several of the critics complain that it's not the ideal game to show off the new hardware and just more of the same from Mario. Not that it impacted their scores, since all four EGM critics gave it nines. With everybody on the same page, Super Mario World averaged a cape-waving 92%. At a time when gamers were starting to look towards CD-ROMs and 32-bit consoles, Star Fox reminded us that there's still a lot of life left in the 16-bit cartridges. While the polygons look rudimentary by today's standards, it's easy to see why critics were won over by this 3D shoot-'em-up. This is a game that was universally praised at the time, with the lowest score coming from a single 8 from Electronic Gaming Monthly. Critics were genuinely stunned with what Nintendo accomplished, and they knew that it was the start of a long-running franchise. It's no-brainer time, trumpeted GamePro. Star Fox is a leap. It's the type of game that'll make someone buy an SNES. The hard game fan also loved it, giving it scores in the low to mid-90s and naming it the game of the month. Over in the UK, Superplay gave it a 93%. Got a 92% from N-Force, and Nintendo Magazine System went all the way up to a 96%. The critics loved the way that Star Fox looked and moved, and several called it a real game changer. With nothing but glowing marks, Star Fox averaged a poorly textured 92%. There's hyperbole, and then there's Donkey Kong Country. Between the shiny new graphics and highly touted technology, 1990s critics were quick to throw high scores in Nintendo's much-hyped platformer. Looking back at it now, there's an argument to be made that some magazines went a little too far. Our game fan, for example, awarded Donkey Kong Country three perfect 100% scores making it one of the best-reviewed games in the magazine's history. EGM's Ed also gave it a perfect score, explaining that Donkey Kong Country is simply the best game out there. He also saw high marks from Video Game Magazine and Super Play, as well as Nintendo Power calling it the best action-adventure game ever for the Super NES or any other video game system. In fact, the only negative review I could find was from Next Generation, which still gave it a 4 out of 5. After all the hype, Donkey Kong Country really is an amazing card. However, the gameplay falls a hair short of your typical Nintendo blockbuster. That's where I come down on Donkey Kong Country 3, but clearly the critics disagreed. The 1994 platformer averaged a 92%. We may think of Super Mario Kart as an unstoppable franchise that will sell on every Nintendo platform, but that certainly wasn't the case in 1992. In fact, multiple critics felt they needed to point out Mario Kart's similarity to another Nintendo racing game. Mario Kart may look like an F-Zero clone on the surface, cautioned Steve Harris at Electronic Gaming Monthly. Even Nintendo Power agreed, noting that the new racing game uses F-Zero's behind-the-driver point of view. 
That said, pretty much everybody else agreed that Super Mario Kart was a winner. GamePro gave it a perfect 5 out of 5 and concluded that the little guys definitely have a lot of drive. Game players gave it a 94% and said that Mario Kart is a must for SNES owners. The game also picked up a 92% from Nintendo Magazine system. All while Superplay called it one of the top three games on the Super Nintendo. There's a reason people are still playing Mario Kart games a quarter century later. This Nintendo racer passes a lot of great games with an average of 92%. Members weren't quite sure what to make of Yoshi's Island when they booted it up for the first time. They marveled at the gorgeously realized graphics, the catchy soundtrack, and the staggering amount of content. But some were conflicted with the changes to the tried and true Mario gameplay. Critics weren't as divided, with the Super Mario World sequel earning high marks from pretty much every publication. Next Generation raved that the most impressive features of Yoshi's Island are in its size and playability. Superplay called it the best game since Super Metroid. Diehard Game Fan gave it a string of perfect scores. You get the point. The truth is, there was only one magazine that didn't like it. Game Players. They liked the look, but ended up giving it a 7.6. They were the outlier, and that's why Yoshi's Island averages a score of 93%. Of all the sequels that populate the Super NES Classic Edition, few have been as influential as Super Metroid. We still see dozens of games released each year that pay homage to what Nintendo accomplished all the way back in 1994. It's considered a classic and has even been named the best video game of all time. So with all this praise, everybody pretty much agrees that Super Metroid is a must buy, right? Well, not exactly. Edge called it a disappointment and gave the 16-bit sequel an 8 out of 10. They complained that the lack of longevity was a real letdown. Electronic Gaming Monthly loved the massive bosses and said that the graphics are too cool to miss. Superplay called it absolutely marvelous and gave it a 92%. That's the same score it got from Nintendo Magazine's system. Back in the United States, the editors of Die Hard Game Fan decided to ditch the usual written review and throw up a bunch of dots for some reason. You also saw both Game Players and Game Pro call it one of the best games of the year. And yet somehow, Edge was disappointed. Some people. Super Metroid averaged a 93%. If they were only going to go with one Final Fantasy game, I'm glad they went with this 1994 classic. Final Fantasy III is not only my favorite 16-bit sequel, but also the top-rated Super NES role-playing game according to critics. Never before have I seen a game with this much depth and detail, raved Electronic Gaming Monthly's Ed. Absolutely brilliant, I cannot say enough good things about Final Fantasy III, says diehard game fans Kay Lee. This enchanting role-playing game tied with Super Street Fighter II is the highest scoring game ever rated by us, exclaimed game players before giving the 98%, which apparently was the magazine's highest rated game. Who knew? If you're looking for low scores, you're not going to find them here. About the closest we get is Nintendo Power, who worried that the biggest RPG of all time may actually be too big. Fans may become lost in the world for months at a time. Oddly enough, no other critic shared this concern. The game picked up a 99% from Die Hard Game Fan, 95% from Superplay, and a perfect 5 out of 5 from GamePro. And let's not forget that Electronic Gaming Monthly named the sequel the best role-playing game of 1994. Final Fantasy III was a big deal, which is why it averaged an incredible 94%. When I went to research and assemble this list, I was 100% sure that The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past would be the top rated game. And yet, here we are, talking about the biggest game of 1992 in the number two position. Don't feel bad for Link just yet, because even though his 16-bit adventure isn't the top rated game on the Super NES Classic Edition, it's still one of the best reviewed games of all time. 
Nintendo Magazine System gave it a 96% and called it the best adventure you can get on any console. Superplay said Zelda 3 is beautifully designed and perfected the way only Nintendo seems to know how. You also saw the game getting 9s from the Super Nintendo Buyer's Guide, 9s in Electronic Gaming Monthly, a 93% from N-Force, and a perfect 5 out of 5 from GamePro. It's also Nintendo Power's best reviewed 16-bit game of all time, with an unmatched score of 4.9 out of 5. The lowest score came from Computer and Video Games, where they compared it to Gauntlet, called it a corker, and gave it an 89%. With all these scores factored in, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past averaged 94%. You can't talk about the 16-bit era without mentioning the importance of Street Fighter 2. This was not only an incredibly influential fighting game that spawned hundreds of copycats, but also one of the Super Nintendo's best exclusives. At a time when everybody wanted to take on Sagat and M. Bison from the comfort of their own homes, Nintendo's console was the only place to do it. The exclusivity quickly changed, but not before Capcom managed to release Street Fighter 2 Turbo. The killer follow-up that packed both the Champion Edition and Hyper Fighting Arcade update into one supersized cartridge. This is, without a single doubt in my mind, the best version of Street Fighter on Nintendo 16-bitter. And it also happens to be the best-reviewed game on the Super NES Classic Edition. The critics were quick to gush over Capcom's achievement. SNES Force called it a virtually perfect arcade conversion, visually stunning and enthralling. Probably the greatest game ever! Nintendo Magazine System said it was a brilliant conversion and everything Turbo fans could have hoped for. It picked up perfect scores from both GamePro and Electronic Gaming Monthly, as well as high marks from all of the critics at Die Hard Game Fan. Just about the only magazine to not be completely swept up in Street Fighter Madness was Nintendo Power. They gave it a 3.9 and called it more of the same. It's probably worth mentioning that Capcom would not have found their way to the top of the list with any other Street Fighter 2 game. Had they gone with Super Street Fighter 2, like they did in Japan, it would have dropped all the way down to the number 19 spot with an average of 77%. Simply put, critics were sick of the annual Street Fighter updates. On the other hand, the first iteration of Street Fighter 2 would have scored better, but it still would have only wound up at the number 2 spot with an average of 94%. With more magazines weighing in and better scores from around the world, Street Fighter 2 Turbo averaged a score of 95%, making it the best reviewed game on the Super NES Classic Edition. Hi, thanks for watching me counting down all 21 games. So, here's the question of the day. The Super NES Classic has a lot of great games, but it could stand to have a few more. What game do you think is missing from this brand new plug and play unit? Let me know in the comments below. Now, if you enjoyed this video, then you're in luck because we're currently in the middle of the best and worst of Electronic Gaming Monthly. It's a weekly series where we go year by year counting down the best and worst games reviewed by EGM. We're about to talk about 1991, so this is a great time to jump on board. We also have a bunch of reviews going live in the next week, along with a mysterious new game show. What could it be? Find out by clicking the subscribe button and supporting what we're doing here. Until then.